welcome. This is indeed a highlight to have the annual lecture by His Eminence. Yesterday, we were truly blessed to have his Bible study, which I think enlightened all of us. And today's lecture promises to be equally motivating and inspirational as he speaks of topics that are relevant and critical in today's society, um, ever-changing society. So your eminence, we all thank you for being with us and pre presenting your lecture. We are together again in this becoming a tradition, I would say, uh, lecture on Friday morning. And we have been in the previous years through a number of topics that were important. I have to say at this point that I think it was Mr. Barakis uh, at some point of time who suggested that instead of having a second Bible study, to have instead a lecture or a presentation on some basic issues that give us a better understanding of our Orthodox Church and tradition and faith. So now again, we have in, we have in the presence of our beloved and respected hierarchs and the council and trustees and you, the members of this kind of week here in Orlando. And we deal with a topic which is, uh, is not uh, theoretical. It's very practical, but at the same time has very serious theoretical aspects. You are aware that in the recent years, they have a number of encounters between our ecumenical patriarch, and the Pope. The Pope was Pope John Paul. The Pope was Pope Benedict XVI. And the Pope is Francis. I have experience being with the patriarch. We have been together in most of these encounters. They were very significant. But Always, when you have these things, you raise the issue of the division of the churches and the need to go to a reunion or union again, to regain the unity of the church of the first nine centuries. So we have an issue. Where do we stand and how is the question and the problem of relationship between Orthodox and Roman Catholic and Protestants, what happens with efforts for reunion, are there any areas of cooperation of any kind, and how is this affecting, and here we come to the specifics, how is it affecting our very lives of our families? The very same topic about overcoming divisions and regain unity, if it had to be discussed in Greece or in Serbia or in Romania or in Bulgaria or in Russia, it would be different because it, there you deal with the tremendous majority of Orthodox population and no mixed marriages. But we have a very different situation. We have plenty of families that are mixed families. So the issue of different religions, and however Christian, I'm not talking about Christians, and Jews or Muslims, but just Christian, is a serious issue, as well as it is the issue of the more general march, so to say, or way towards unity. The church, as you know, created by the Lord, and in a way triumphantly and unexpectedly appearing on Pentecost with the apostles talking to the languages of various people, and then started the mission, 
Uh, the church started as a united church for the first eight, nine centuries. At that time, there was a church that was called Holy, Catholic, and Apostolic. It's in the creed. Pistevu is me an Aegean, Catholic, and Apostolic Ecclesia, in a Holy, Catholic, and Apostolic Church. Catholic there in the creed has no connection with the Roman Catholic Church. It's an adjective indicating universality, wholeness. So the church in the beginning was one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. And at the same time, it was an orthodox church in contradistinction from the heresies. That's, that was the case. Now, this one church stretched across the Mediterranean world, up into Northern Europe and in the British Isles, eastward to Persia and India, to the south into North Africa and Ethiopia. By the end of the 8th century, however, large portions of these areas were conquered and occupied by Muslim, Muslim political or military rulers. Yet even in these regions, the Christian faith persisted and the Christian churches remained united in communion with each other. So no matter what the political and ethnic change that happened with the progress of the Arabs and the Muslims, the church were united. During these first eight centuries, the great church had the first and only ecumenical councils. As you know, there were many councils in the first centuries. Some of them, just I would like to mention uh, two of them. One was in Carthage, Carthagene, North Africa. The other was in Laodicea, Asia Minor. But they were local, important, but local councils and synods. However, there are synods in the history of the United Church that are called and characterized as ecumenical, as they brought together Christian leaders from all parts of the ecumeni, the known world, and they made proclamations about belief and practice that applied to all Christians. The seven ecumenical, first seven ecumenical councils, and only ecumenical councils, I repeat, were conscious efforts of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church to express its unity throughout the known world. A parenthesis here. To convene in an ecumenical council, some of them had 600 participants, bishops, that came from long distances. Some of the participants had to travel more than a month to reach the place. Some of them died on their way to the synod. And some of them died on their way back to their seats. It was not an easy thing, but it was, we should say, a novelty. It was a new thing in the world. There were no international ecumenical meetings of any kind before the synods. The church introduced the institution of international ecumenical meetings. That's important. Church did not introduce only other things, faith, etc. But even institutions like people from different countries meeting together. The first ecumenical council was convened by St. Constantine the Great in the city of Nicaea, Nicaea, in the year 325. Why in Nicaea? Why in Nicaea? Because at that time Constantinople was being built as a city. So there was no possibility for a city that was in the process of being built to have to host such an important meeting. So it happens in Nicaea, 
which is across from Constantinople on the Asia Minor area. And this then for, followed by a number of synods. The second was in Constantinople in the year 381. And the second ecumenical synod had as a presiding person a great father of the church, St. Gregory the Theologian. Then the third was in Ephesus, Asia Minor, the fourth in Chalcedon, across from Constantinople, fifth and sixth in Constantinople, and the seventh again in Nicaea, in Nicaea. Please note that all ecumenical synods took place in the soil, the ground, the area of the ecumenical patriarchate, not in other areas, not in the patriarchate of Alexandria, Antioch, Jerusalem, or Rome, just Constantinople, the seven ecumenical councils. And they issued both declarations and statements on dogmatic issues, which means definitions and clarifications about faith, and also, uh, or most of them, a number of canons, which are rules issued on the basis of the gospel, but applying to daily practices of the church. As you know, for our information, allow me to repeat sometimes things that you know, but sometimes it's good to remember things. Our creed was formulated in its first part in the first ecumenical council. It's the part that deals with God the Father and Christ. Nicaea ended with what we say in the creed, Kesena Kironi Sun Christon, Pathonda Tafenda, Kianastanda Tetriti Mera Katafas, Kianel Thonda Susornus having ascended to heavens and seated at the right hand of the Father. There ended the declaration and the statement of the first ecumenical synod. The second, and that was the reason for that, because the synod was convinced to fight against the heresy of Arios, who refused to accept the full divinity of Christ. So it's a Christological, it's a Christ-oriented series of declarations. The Second Ecumenical Council had to deal with another issue. There were some heretics who fought against the divinity of the Holy Spirit, the so-called pneumatomachy, the fighters against the Holy Spirit. So the Second Ecumenical Council was convened, and we have the additional articles, case to Pneuma to Ion and in the Holy Spirit, who proceeds from the Father, and is worshipped together with the Father who spoke to the prophets in one Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. These are items of the Second Ecumenical Council. So by the year 381, we have the fullness of the creed as we recite exactly today. And this is a creed of the one holy apostolic and united church. This was the case until the ninth century. It was in the ninth century that the first serious break between the Church of Rome and the rest of the Christian world appear. In the year 858, 858, on Christmas Day, a new ecumenical patriarch was consecrated by the name of Photius. This is now whom we know as Saint Photius the Great. That was an unusual case because over the course of five days, Fortius, being a layman, was ordained deacon, presbyter, bishop, and enthroned as a patriarch. It was not unique, it had happened again, and it was not uncanonical. 
that in five days you have someone from the status of lay person becoming ecumenical patriarch. All the more since St. Photius was a terrific, terrific person as a theologian and as a, a, a family. He was involved in the issues of state, but mostly he was someone who saved, and here comes a bit of Hellenism too, who saved the uh, titles and the works existing in Greek literature. Many of the things written have been lost. We have Plato, we have Aristotle, we have plenty from Stoics, uh, Posidonius, Plutarch, we have the, uh, the theatrical plays, uh, we have scientific things from Hippocrates, but plenty of other words have been lost. So Fortius, what he did, he was able to compile a list with everything, if possible, that was written in Greek language, offering a short kind of resume. The book is called Mirio Vivlos, which translates a book of 10,000 books because of the 10,000 titles that saved. It is a terrific thing. At any event, he was elected. At this time, uh, the Bishop of Rome was Pope Nicholas I. Pope Nicholas was not willing to accept Photius as a legitimate patriarch because no one had consulted him about the dismissal of Photius' predecessor, Patriarch Ignatius. And no one has consulted him about the election of Photius. After some delegations back and forth, Pope Nicholas issued an anathema against Pat Patriarch Photius which means, anathema means, the strongest form of excommunication. It was not an excommunication for the whole of the church in Constantinople Patriarchate. It was a personal excommunication of Patriarch Fortius. This issue were several issues. The primary question was an administrative one. Does the Pope of Rome have administrative authority over the Patriarchate of Constantinople? and the Patriarchate's of East. St. Photius was properly and canonically chosen by the Synod of Constantinople. His elevation from layman to Patriarch was not unusual. He played no part in the removal of his predecessor. Even so, Pope Nicholas disapproved of the election. He would give his blessing, oh, here comes the trick, he would give his blessing only if the Church of Constantinople turned over to Rome the authority over the churches of Sicily, Calabria in Italy, and of Illyricon, which is modern-day Albania, Montenegro, Bosnia, and Croatia. If you give them to me, I'm recognizing I'm lifting the anathema. Of course, Patriarch Photius said, no, we can play this game here. We are serious people. So Pope Nicholas was testing, actually, the limits of papal authority, primacy. Primacy in the language of church means the state of being first among equals. It does mean authority of an absolute administrative nature. So then, the, uh, there is no question in the East that the Pope was first among equals. But there was never an acceptance that because of that, he would be somehow the one who would decide administrative issues that happened in Constantinople, Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem. It would be the authority in Italy, Rome, and the area around that. So then the primacy was some sort of a recognizing the older brother in a family. 
the older brother has not a dictatorial power over the family. It's just one of member of the family. Before Pope Nicholas, no pope tried to exercise a unilateral veto over the election of a patriarch. In trying to remove Fortius as patriarch, Pope Nicholas was making a bold and unprecedented grasp of power over all the earth and over every church. The claim of worldwide jurisdiction for Rome was an unprecedented kind of distortion and innovation, a non-permissible extension of power. It was rejected by Constantinople. Around the same time, the king of Bulgarians, Boris, had accepted Christianity for himself and his people. So in 865 AD, he received holy baptism from clergy from the ecumenical patriarchy. But Boris wanted the Bulgarian church to have the same independent absolute status as the churches of Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria, and Constantinople. It was something unheard of, it just a new church to be given self-governing power when they were not yet mature enough to be self-governed. But this is what King Boris wanted. So then King Boris, since Constantinople said, no, you have to wait for a while. King Boris turned to Pope Nicholas and asked for a better deal with the Pope. Contrary to proper jurisdictional respect, the Roman Church sent Latin-speaking missionaries to the Bulgarians, the Balkans. These priests began to teach some things a bit different from what was the tradition in the East. The Roman clergy, for instance, taught that there should be a mandatory status for all clergy. There was no possibility for married clergy. They used also the unleavened bread for the Eucharist, not leavened bread. And there were some other details. But these Latin missionaries to the Bulgarians brought a new dogma with them. And this is known as the filioque, which is the insertion in the original creed of Const Nicaea and Constantinople, as we know it, the insertion in Latin language of the word filioque. What is this in addition? In the article, pertinent article of the creed, we speak about, we believe in the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father, who is glorified together with the Father and the Son. That's the formulation of the undivided church. This priest, Roman priest who came from Rome to Bulgaria, inserted the word filioque, which means in Greek would be to ek tu patros ke tu iu ek porevomenon. Why they did that? Here comes to the point of theological subtlety. Because they did not know that by doing that, they did something very wrong, which is they diminished the real deity of the Holy Spirit. Because now the Holy Spirit has to come from both the Father and the Son. He's in an inferior position. In the original, the Father, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and then it's sent to the church by the Son. It's a very different thing. It's the modus of origin, the way of origin. So this philosophy became a big issue and you might hear in our discussions that we have, it's always uh, an issue. But for Pope, uh, Nicholas was not a problem because he thought 
that for some uh, reason mm -hmm. he had the absolute authority over the church, even in matters of dogma, even interfering with a decision by two ecumenical councils. So Patriarch Photius regarded the actions of Pope Nicholas as schismatic, in other words, causing division, a rift in the unity of the body of Christ, and finally as heretical, as teaching wrong things in place of the truth established by the United Church. So, four years after the time he was Fortius, anathematized by Pope Nicholas, he in turn anathematized the Pope in 1867. But it so happened that because of the transportation and communication means at that time, there was not an instant conveying of messages like happened today. Uh, when the message reached Rome, Pope Nicholas had passed away by natural death. So he never received really alive the decree of his excommunication by the Patriarch. So then, and that was not done by the Patriarch Fortius. Patriarch Fortius convened the Synod in Constantinople uh, inviting uh, the um, patriarchs of Alexandria, Jerusalem, and Antioch, and have then this decision about the Pope. So then, after that, the new Pope that came tried to do some amends, and it was an effort. So soon after that, in 1879, a council in Constantinople formally lifted both anathemas, and re-establish the unity in the church between East and West. However, they remain the issues. They remain the practice of celibacy, absolute celibacy for the clergy. They remain the issue of filioque. They remain the issue of using the azims, the non-leavened bread in the Eucharist, and some two or three other secondary things. So, in other words, you have a re-established unity, but now in a way that is under the surface, there are unresolved issues that sooner or later might cause problems, and that was not difficult to predict. So, uh, what happens later on, it was a situation with, again, a, a controversy, Two centuries, more or less, one and a half century passed in this kind of condition until the point when uh, Pope of Rome became Leo X, and at that time the patriarch was Michael Hirularius. Now, what happened is that uh, they continue to have a, a number of discussions and the Pope sent a letter asking the East, Constantinople, and the other patriarchs to conform with what he asked for, all these pending issues. Patriarch Michael Kirularius said, no, we cannot do that. It's, it's impossible. So the condition was brought to a very strong conflict. And what happened? Three clergy from Rome were sent, and they were sent to Constantinople in the year 1054. The delegates enter after the patriarch refused to conform with the, the Pope, enter the Church of Hagia Sophia, and deposited on the holy altar in front of and view of the clergy and the lay people who were in the church, a declaration of excommunication. Legally, these legates had no authority because they were sent by Pope Leo, who in the meantime passed away. 
So if the one who said you gave the authority, then you don't have the authority. But they did. They proceeded. Patriarch Michael, in turn, excommunicated, not the Roman, the Roman Church, the three legates, and decided in the East that they should not include the name of the Pope in the diptychs. This practically means that in a liturgy when a patriarch officiates, they use the names of the heads of the autocephalous churches. So from the year 1054, no mention of the Pope would be during the liturgy. In addition to the 14, there was 14, there were less than 14 at that time. Now, from that point on, we have a serious kind of rift. We have a division. Things might have changed. If we didn't have the Fourth Crusade, the Fourth Crusade happened 150 years later. There were Crusader soldiers from Western Europe, and they were on their way to the Holy Land. Their plan was to go through Egypt, they reached through Egypt, the Holy Land. But they made a stop in Constantinople. They were there and they helped to put into the emperor's throne, because of the conflicts there in the Byzantine court, a emperor by the name of Isatius. In return, they asked for an exorbitant amount of money in order to pay the Venetian sailors and boats that brought them. It's quite an issue here. The people of Constantinople rebelled against this kind of exorbitant asking of money, killed the emperor. The Crusaders invade Constantinople and sack Constantinople. Here comes a unbelievable kind of situation. They ransacked churches, looted priceless works of art, gold, silver from the holy altar, precious gems, holy vessels, even holy relics. At that time, the holy relics of St. John Chrysostom, among others, and St. Gregory the Theologian were brought in Rome. They were brought back a few years now before, but after eight centuries of being in Constantinople. But these crusaders did more than that. They massacred plenty of the inhabitants of Constantinople, they entered homes and raped women and girls. And they even turned holy icons into tables for cards and dice playing games. For the Orthodox Christians of Constantinople, the behavior of these crusaders uh, was shocking, to say the least, and horrifying, they had engaged in intentional and systematic sacrilege. Not even the Muslim, Muslim invaders of Jerusalem had behaved that way. It was a, a, a unique kind of phenomenon. It was a statement in the clearest terms that the soldiers of the Fourth Crusade did not regard the Orthodox of Constantinople as Christians. Therefore, they thought they have the liberty to do whatever they please them. After the Fourth Crusade, it was a very, very advanced division that involved now not only the officials of the church, but every man, woman, and child 
of both churches. The sack of Constantinople continued for nearly 60 years, as you know from history, under a Latin kingdom and a Latin king, when finally in 1261, after 60 years approximately, Byzantine Emperor Michael VIII retook the city, and but what city he took back? It was a totally impoverished capital, shrunken, divided empire with no financial means. So it was almost predictable that this glorious and unique Byzantine empire could not last for long at the impact and the invasion of a ferocious, truly Ottoman Turk big army. But before this happened, there was one more attempt on the part of the churches, uh, issued basically initiated by Rome, but also involving Constantinople because the emperor was in real terrible need to have military assistance from the West in order to face the Turks. So they thought that if they do something, meant the differences be united, then they could have the military assistance and keep the Constantinople and the empire the way it was, even limited. So there was a synod convened in the year 1838, just less than 20 years from the final fall of Constantinople, they was convened in a place called Ferrara in Italy, and then moved to Florence, Italy. They came up with a number of statements, and they signed this document. However, there were hierarchs like Mark, Bishop of Ephesus, and others who said, no, we cannot sign that. And when the theological delegates and hierarchs returned to Constantinople, the people said, we cannot accept your signature. We consider the decision non-existing. So whatever happened and whatever was issued from Ferrara, Florida, was just brought to nil, to nothing. For the Roman Catholic Church, Ferrara Florentia is counted among her synods, not for the Orthodox Church. A number of centuries passed, for five, actually for five centuries, Constantinople and Rome stand apart from one another. Then in 1963, and 64, Pope Paul VI of Rome announced a trip to Jerusalem. Our ecumenical patriarch at that time, Athenagoras, former Archbishop of America, said, I'm going to be to Jerusalem too to meet the Pope. So they, when he was there, a reporter Ask our patriarch Athenagoras, why you have come to Jerusalem? He said he was a man of uh, immense kind of wit and wisdom and humor. He said, to say good morning to my beloved brother, the Pope. And he added, you must remember that it is 500 years since we have spoken to each other. <laughs> it's, it's a theological statement of high value. So a new era of mutual respect started. And then next year, it was the lifting of the anathemas by the two churches. And also 
But I would like again to repeat, the anathemas were personal for the Pope and the Patriarch, not for the churches as, as a whole. But they were lifted and then a dialogue started, a theological dialogue to sit down together and see what is dividing and what is uniting us. So this has been an ongoing thing. The uh, Vatican II Synod that was convened in Rome was attended by Orthodox theologians. On our part, it was uh, the former Metropolitan of Pittsburgh, Maximus, who participated as an observer on behalf of the Ecumenical Patriarchate among with other people. He was an Archimandrite at that time, a professor at Holy Cross School of Theology. So that was the starting of the dialogue. And this theological dialogue has been an ongoing reality since then, with an interruption after the changing in Eastern Europe in the 90, early 90s, when we have the problem of the Uniats, mostly coming from Ukraine. Uniats is a phenomenon an aberration, allow me to say in theological language, in the history of the church, because it deals with people who maintain the full of dogmas and practices of the Orthodox Church, but they decided to be administrative under the Pope. This is why they have married clergy. And if you go to a liturgy of theirs, you might think that this is an Orthodox liturgy, not a Roman Catholic liturgy. So the, during the dialogue, the Orthodox people said, we cannot have a dialogue if you have this kind of phenomenon which was created as a propaganda means to attract Orthodox. And there were some areas of these unions in Middle East, there are Melkites, etc., in Ukraine, and sporadically here and there, but not more. Uh, that brought a stop in the dialogue. However, the dialogue was somehow resumed after a few years and it continues full speed today. We have been in similar dialogue here in this country. And this dialogue has been conducted by the Orthodox body of this country. In other words, it was under SCOBA. Today, the dialogue is conducted under the assembly of all canonical bishops. It's a full developed, fully developed dialogue, dealing with, gradually, with various issues. Now, I have to bring to your knowledge that this dialogue here in this country produced some outstanding statements not in the form of just one sentence, statements with a long text accompanying brief declarations, but a very fully developed text. So there are texts on baptism, on sacraments, etc. And when we send them to the Ecumenical Patriarchate and the other Orthodox leaders, they said, Goodness, we didn't know that you did such a thing in the United States because it was quite an advanced status of theological production. For the simple reason that here we have quite a number of brilliant theologians on both sides of the church. And we continue the dialogue. And the dialogue is, 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 is going on. Now, in the present status, of the churches, along with the ongoing theological dialogues, there are continuous expressions of mutual respect and brotherly love. We have witnessed, for example, the reciprocal visits of the Ecumenical Patriarch and the Pope to each other's thronic celebrations. The thronic celebration is a feast day of the apostle under whose patronage the Patriarchate or the Pope is. For instance, St. Peter for Rome, celebration in 
on the 29th of June, the first called Apostle Andrew for the patriarch, our patriarchate on the 30th of November each year. During this celebration, there is always a representation, sometime the patriarch himself or the Pope. Last November, it was the Pope himself who came to the celebration in Constantinople. We were there. That was quite an advanced step. That's much more than a meeting in Jerusalem in the 1964, or even the meeting in Jerusalem last year again between the Pope and the Patriarch. You come to this person, and the, our Patriarch has been in Rome. Allow me a personal thing here, if I may share with you. Uh, I'm sorry that it's personal, but it is a part of the, of the ongoing history. Back in uh, some time, during the uh, uh, reign of Pope John Paul, I was representing the Patriarchate in Rome for the feast of St. Peter, together with a bishop and an archimandite and a deacon. And we were at the uh, very official celebration, which was in the evening, at the uh, St. Peter's Cathedral, not inside the cathedral, outside, because as you know, the square in front of St. Peter is a big square. It was filled with thousands and thousands of pilgrims. So the liturgy took place outside on, on top of the steps that lead to Saint, inside St. Peter. Here comes the Pope. He is not in good health, that's why the car comes as close as possible to the holy altar. And the Pope is alone celebrating the liturgy with the assistance of a priest or a deacon, but not the other uh, cardinals or anything. And we are close, next to the a temporary altar created there for the occasion. I am on the somehow on the left hand side at the distance where Mr. Arthur is here, just a few yards. And on the other side is the body of the cardinals. So the Pope celebrates. And here comes the moment when we have in our liturgy to agapisum and allilus, ina and omonia omorgisum. Let us love each other so that in Concord, we'll confess Patera, your own Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, okay. At that point, if you notice in our church, there is the exchange of keys in the celebrants, with the celebrants. So someone comes to me and says, the Pope wants you. So I see that here is a number of cardinals, the courier. The cardinal who is the prime minister of Vatican, the cardinal who is the minister of foreign affairs, I mean the top people. No one is invited there. He invites me as representing the ecumenical patriarch to exchange the keys of peace. And then it was not last moment said at some point, now you speak. So I face this huge crowd there. It so happened that it was a celebration of, I think, 20 something years of papacy of Pope John. And as I convey the many happy years to the Pope for his 25th, whatever it was, anniversary, this crowd exploded in something unbelievable. They were shouting, they were clapping their hands, bravo, it to this kind of thing. I'm there, <laughs> stunned. This is part of the ongoing relationship between Roman Catholic and Orthodox. You see, these kind of things are not recorded by the very strict historians. They deal with texts. They forget these type of things, which are indicative or what happened with the president Pope, I asked him at, when he was in Constantinople after the liturgy, and, and I have some rosaries 
uh, given to me from our cameraman, who is a Roman Catholic. He said, you are going to be with the Pope. Could you ask him to bless the thing? I said, of course. So I asked Pope Francis. I said, this is what your predecessor did, uh, both Pope John Paul and Pope uh, Benedict. Could you bless these rosaries for some of your people I'm going to give back, not myself? He said, of course. So he blesses the rosaries. And he says immediately, please pray for me. Now, look, that's not, you know, the Vatican and the Patriarchate have the strictest, the most advanced protocol, even in the highest level of the White House or royal courts in Europe. There is no such a protocol as it is in the Vatican and in Constantinople. This kind of thing is unheard of. It's not the way you deal, you deal with the protocol. So these are things that show some really uh, important things that could be done. And uh, we have seen also other possibilities in recent years of cooperation. Now, we have to be aware, however, that there are theological and ecclesiological differences that remain. We have the filioque, although it has been a progress in this thing, and I have been present in a special meeting uh, in Vatican when it was an effort by Roman Catholic, prominent theologians, to do something with the filioque, and they managed to do something important. They said, let's now have in our liturgical books the page across from the page that contains the creed with the filioque has a page without the filioque and leave it to the discretion of the priest who celebrates to use the one or the other. And when Pope Benedict came to the United States and there was a liturgy in Washington, D.C., and uh, there I was curious to see what will happen with the creed. I said, now, what is going to do this pope? Is he going to use the filioque? He knows that there are Orthodox people here. I would be very much upset. He would omit the filioque. Then the Roman Catholic were going to, to, to go to a revolution here. But Pope Benedict, being an, a good old friend, we knew each other for years, and professor, he knew what he would do. He comes by using not the Const Nicene Constantinopolitan creed. There is another creed, much shorter, the so-called apostolic, which is valid, has a legitimation, and there is nothing about Philioque there. He uses this creed. When we meet after that, I said, Your Holiness, that was quite a thing that you did. I had to do that, he said. It was a pastoral decision. I didn't want to scandalize either side. But it's indicative of the uh, disposition. We have, however, this. We have a new dogma of the Immaculate Conception that has nothing to do with the virginal birth of Christ. The Immaculate Conception has to do with the idea introduced in the 18th century, 19th century, by the Roman Catholic Church, that the mother, the Panagia was conceived without the ancestral primordial sin that was introduced to the humanity through Adam and Eve. That's not acceptable by us. She was just conceived in a normal way. Christ was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And that's, that's the story. So that was the thing. It was also the dogma that the Pope is infallible when he speaks ex cathedra from his seed. And all the more is always, you have to know, the big problem is the primacy of Rome, of the Pope, understood as absolute administrative authority over the entire church. We are for the synodal 
administration of the church, not the church be administered by one person as a representative of Christ and St. Peter on earth. So we have a long way ahead of us. It's if a journey of a thousand miles begins with one step, a journey to return to unity begins with even small steps. It's not to be accomplished instantly. In their recent meeting in Constantinople, the two, the Patriarch and the Pope, used a very nice expression, answering the question by hundreds of journalists, when and how close we are to unity. And the answer was, the unity will happen when God wants it and the way God wants it. That's the answer. When God and how God wants it. But in the meantime, we have to, to work and work in concrete terms and appreciate the efforts. Our ecumenical patriarch is a real pioneer in this issue. And if you, if you compare what happened in 64 to what happened during the recent years under Patriarch Bartholomew, there is no comparison. It's a terrific uh, offering, and uh, this is something that I think we have to contribute. Now, let me just finish with one more thing. I spoke about the Roman Catholic situation because that was the central thing. We had, in the meantime, uh, in the uh, 15th century, the split then of the Protestant. So today, you should be aware that uh, uh, we, as Orthodox, we are involved in a dialogue with the Anglicans, Episcopalians, although it went through turbulent seas because of some the peculiar things that the Episcopalians did, and uh, with the Lutherans. Even it was a, but didn't continue for a long time, something with the Muslims and with Jewish, Jewish-Christian dialogue. Just, you are in a dialogue because this is a way to convey what we have and we believe. We don't think that the non-Orthodox Christian should be informed by reading some books. You have to engage in an alive way. And you know, if we are firm in what we believe, we don't have to be afraid of anything in any dialogue. I have to tell you, when I was there in Rome for this, representation of the Patriarch. The next day we have a two-hour discussion with then Cardinal Ratzinger, who became a Pope. And we have a discussion just openly. I didn't, I didn't have to do anything to please him or do something, to prove something to him. Because I knew that what we have is exactly the truth given to us by God, without somehow pretending that we are just. We are open and we are ready to share what we have. Now, we have to think, however, that the need for being, again, united and be one belongs to the very, very central message of the gospel. Remember, the Lord, just hours before Gethsemane and his arrest and the ensuing crucifixion, Ending his long talk in the Gospel of John, chapter 13 to 17, he prayed to his father, I do not pray for these, his immediate disciples only, but for those who believe in me through their word. This is we. That they may be all one, even as thou, Father, are in me, and I in thee, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. The glory which thou hast given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, 
and thou in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them, even as thou hast loved me. Unity as an expression of the absolute love that the Father has for the Son in the Holy Trinity. Thank you.